Hello everybody, welcome back. I'm the Strategy Professor and today we're going to be talking about the 10.1 support tier list. So as always, if you enjoy the content, please be sure to like and subscribe. It helps out a ton. Check out the rest of the content on the channel as well. We do fresh patch notes, tier lists uh, for every single patch. And then we also have in-depth champion guides, topical guides, coaching sessions, all sorts of great stuff on the channel. And we stream every night starting around 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube. And we usually go till about 2 a.m or 3 a.m. And I try to be very conversational. I talk at the chat as much as I can. I try to explain all of my decisions and we have a very friendly, chill community. So come on by and check that out. Some of the most recent guides that I did that should help you out if you're looking to climb in season 10, so be sure to look at that. I did an updated how to carry a support guide, really in depth, great um, three techniques that you can do, including better information control, like vision, better gold management. Um, and this overall better decision making that you can do through uh, lane management, tabbing, moving through all that information. Tempo was a really big one that I talked about there, and I hadn't talked about that a ton in um, previous videos. So check it out. It's got a lot of new stuff, even if you're a veteran of the channel. Um, and then I also had a five tips if you're an AD carry player or you have a friend who's AD carry. Um, five tips to improve as AD carry from a supports perspective. And to be honest, a lot of that stuff in there also applies to support and could apply to any lane in terms of lane management, pressure, shot calling, and things like that. So be sure to check all that out, and I'm going to be coming up with a lot of new guides as well over time. Okay, let's go ahead and get in here. So just a real quick TLDR, if you haven't really followed the preseason that well, or you're new to the channel, um, the meta shook up quite a bit. Nautilus and Leona are still very good, but now Janna and Soraka are kind of at the top of the roost, or they're very, very close to the top, particularly Soraka, and a lot of people are figuring this out, but they're really late to the party but they're here now, right? So if they would have jumped on this train, you know, month or month and a half ago, could have gained a lot of ELO and maybe placed higher coming into the season. But nevertheless, people are starting to figure it out. And a lot of what is driving this is still there. They've changed a, a little bit of it. And we'll change, we'll talk about that here in a second, but there's no more on hit procs on the items. So you don't um, gain health anymore off of relic shield procs and you don't gain extra damage off of frost fang items as well. So the people that are the biggest hit with this are the two main tanks, the Leona and the Nautilus, because they have a lot less sustain with that. And then um, high-pressure early-game champions like Zyra are also hit because they don't get that free proc damage. Enchanters overall, Janna and um, Soraka are okay with this, though, because they scale really well into the late game. So if everybody's a bit weaker in the early game, that's fine by them. There's also no more CDR, so no more cooldown reduction on the Tier 2 items. So champions that really hurt for CDR in their builds aren't going to like this. So the biggest ones here are going to be um, APN Enchanters early on because you used to be able to get the 10% off of Frostfang. Uh, so you're going to have to find some other way to get that. So I've been getting Ionian Boots on um, Soraka. On Janna, it's a bit more questionable because she does gain extra, um, extra power off of move speed. But um, if you really feel like you want that CDR, then Ionian Boots can be a good substitute. However... Uh, the tanks, so enchanters can go Ionian boots. AP supports can't do that though. So that has hurt champions like Zyra, like Brand, and the people out there who play Velkaz and things like that. And that has hurt them a little bit because they can't really go Ionians. Um, they have to go Sork boots a lot of times. I think they do, or at least mobility boots. So, anyways, that does hurt the tanks later on though because tanks uh, typically before the preseason would rush straight to a tier three gold item because they got a lot of value off of that, including the 10% CDR. But now they can't get the CDR anywhere. And with tanks, it's particularly difficult because they almost always have to go either a defensive boot or mobility boots. They can't go Ionian. And um, one of their core items that's a potential to get and is decent in some situations, Locket of the Iron Solari, doesn't have CDR on it, which really sucks. And other popular items also don't have CDR on it that people are getting more and more, like Gargoyle Stoneplate. So you're really just kind of stuck with um, Zeke's or Knight's Vow as your early items. And if you have to do anything else, you're going to be hurting for CDR. So, And that does suck because a lot of these tanks like Nautilus and Leona have really, really powerful ults that virtually guarantee a kill if the enemy doesn't have flash. So you're going to have 10% less of those ults in kind of the mid to late game, which it is not a feels good. Relic Shield has been super strong. Now, they did change up the uh, ward items a little bit here in this patch. But it's pretty much guaranteed fast wards early. You almost always get it around 10 minutes. Sometimes a little bit faster if you get every single cannon. If you get pressured off the cannons, it might be 12 minutes. But you're going to get it really well early on. And then flat HP is super strong in the early game. 
It's probably the strongest stat in the game because everyone has such a low amount of HP anyways, and every single point of HP counts because the fights can get really, really close because minions are doing a lot of damage. Ignite does a disproportionately huge amount of damage to people in the early game. So every little point of HP matters. It's great for surviving all ends. And a nice perk of that item as well, Relic Shield, is that your AD carry, if you're doing this properly and you're not getting zoned, and most ELOs you're not going to get zoned off of the cannon that much, but it means that your, your AD carry can't miss the cannon, which is huge. I mean, I know that sounds a little harsh, but let's be honest, a lot of people miss those cannons as AD carry. I know even sometimes when I play AD carry, I might miss the cannons. So the fact that you can always clean those cannons up for the AD carry is huge. So it's a lot more than it appears to be, right? Because if you have Relic Shield and you hit the cannon early on, you're giving both people like 70 gold, right? It's 140 gold. But then if your AD carry would have missed it anyways, then you're losing that opportunity cost. So Relic is really generating like 200 gold for you, 210 gold, because it would have been zero gold and now you're getting the 140 out of it. Um... But anyway, so it's it's generating a whole lot of value there. I guess that would be generating 140 gold instead of the 70 gold. Um, but either way, that's a nice perk of it. And you usually complete your tier 3 ward item fairly fast too because you can always walk up and auto attack minions, right? If there's someone's in the wave, you can just walk up, auto attack, and stack it up in the mid game. So you usually have it completed between like 17 and 20 minutes. But if you are going for a Frostfang build, for example, you can't always just walk up and harass the enemy with most supports. Because it's just going to be too dangerous to do that. There are some champions like Zyra where you can activate a Q plant and shoot it like really long range to get procs. But for the most part, a lot of supports are going to have a really hard time stacking up that Frost Fang. Or it's going to be much harder than Relic Shield anyways. Unless everyone's just like 24-7 fighting. Which, you know, does happen a lot of times. But either way. I think that's made Relic Shield uh, a lot better than I initially thought it was going to be at the start of the preseason. Uh, you can't buy the four ward item early, so that does nerf tanks a little bit once again because that item was so good on tanks. That's going to be a nerf to pro vision. Doesn't apply to most people in here. I assume a lot of pros aren't watching this, but that does affect the vision game in pro. Uh, you get a huge amount of gold in the early game, especially because you don't have to upgrade this item. So you get an extra 500 gold in your pocket, and that heavily favors enchanters because they scale much better with gold than tanks. Because a lot of the tank items, they just aren't as strong as the enchanter items. And most of the time, they don't give as much benefit to other people on your team. So, like, yes, Zeke's does give some extra damage to your AD carry, but it's not going to be as powerful as something like Ardent Sensor would be on Enchanter support. So, I think that's a huge thing that people really underestimate. Be sure to check out my How to Carry a Support video if you want to know more about why Enchanters scale so hard. But a lot of it just comes down to the um, plus healing and shielding stat. It's just really overpowered. It's under-budgeted. It's just super strong because heals and shields scale with resistances rather than against them. So as your allies get more and more armor and more and more magic resist, then you become stronger and stronger as an enchanter with those heals and shields. Versus if you are a damage dealer, you're trying to build a lot of damage, and the enemy starts building a lot of resistances, then you can potentially become weaker and weaker if you fall behind. So anyways, if someone just gets a wheelbarrow of money, all the supports just get like dumped a whole lot of money, then the enchanters are going to be some of the biggest beneficiaries of that in solo queue. Um, and then top and jungle tanks are kind of back. Now, this has been shifting you know, in and out in the preseason. I think it's pretty balanced meta overall. There are quite a few tanks that are coming back a little bit. You're seeing Orn is very strong right now. Mundo's still pretty good. Zack is good. Nunu's pretty solid. Even Olaf is not really a tank per se, but he's pretty hard to kill, especially in the early and mid game. So a lot of those types of champs are coming back into favor a little bit. Uh, the Conqueror nerf also helps tanks out a lot. Aftershock buff, if someone actually builds a lot of tank items, then Aftershock's going to be better. Although it is weaker on early game all-in champions like Nautilus, like Leona, for those level 2 all-ins, it's a lot weaker in terms of your resistances. And then the jungle itself is going to be slower in general, so that's going to give a bit more time for some of these uh, farm tanks to scale up a bit. Um, and enchanters also scale well with resistances, we just talked about that, so that makes tanks a little bit more um, appealing as well. And that makes ADCs a lot stronger also. So part of why a lot of the ADCs have been coming back is there are less overall assassins in the meta. It still happens. There are still some. But there are a little bit less because tanks kind of hard counter them and like CC hard counters them in the mid to late game. So they have a much smaller window where they can assassinate. Because if you have like two tanks on your team, then that Talon on the enemy team, those are two targets the Talon can't hit. So he's going to have to figure out a way to flank and work around those tanks, work around all that CC 
in order to assassinate the back line. Whereas a lot of the back half of last season, everybody was playing a squishy champion, so the Talon could just kill anyone, anytime, anywhere. So it has made it a little bit harder on assassins, but there still can be really strong in the right circumstances. Okay. Um, but let's go ahead and we'll, we'll just get into the picks here. One thing that I will mention as well that I don't see a lot of other guides talking about that I've found a lot of success with, and I was Diamond 3. We got demoted, uh, I think it was last night, into Diamond 4. Had a really bad stretch of a couple of days, but either way, um, one thing I found a lot of success with with a lot of enchanters is going for Poro, like Ghost Poro plus Ulti Hunter. And Ghost Poro seems a little weird, but the reason that it's so strong is it basically ends up giving you 30 AP between somewhere around 15 to 30 minutes in the game, depending on how well you use the Ghost Poro. And it gives you extra vision early. That ex basically ward extension is really, really nice, particularly when you're trying to watch things like Dragon or Popular Gank Pass before you get your support item completed. And that's really, really handy. So it, it kind of extends your wards for an extra minute or so every time the ghost poro spawn now it doesn't have the same level of vision as a normal ward which kind of sucks i wish they would give it normal ward vision but it does ping also if someone walks across it so it does kind of let you know if you're not watching your mini map like a hawk if someone's stepping over a ghost poro so it's really handy so it's a little bit of vision early that's nice but the main attraction is the extra uh 30 ap which is 600 gold equivalent that's equal to two kills around 15 to 20 minutes in the game that's what makes it strong and then Ulti Hunter is also super good, especially a lot of the top end supports have really high impact ults, um, especially Soraka. And it's really easy for Soraka to get uh, stacks of Ulti Hunter because you can get assists across the entire map with your ult. So I think that's really nice getting the extra 25% cooldown on your ult. You know, there are some other builds that are still going on. Some people still get like Boots Biscuits or Boots Cosmic Insight. Um, depending on the uh, support that you're going. Stopwatch is a lot more powerful in Challenger. It's not as good um, at Platinum and lower, but there are some other options out there, but I think that that build is definitely something that I think has been really powerful that a lot of people don't talk about or really get that much. As a secondary, almost no supports are going to be going Domination Primary, but as a secondary, that can be a decent choice in the right builds. Okay, speaking of which, let's go ahead and get in here <coughs> into our picks. I just wanted to catch everyone up to speed because I know there will be a lot of people that are coming in that didn't play at all during the preseason or might be newer to the channel that are trying to learn a little bit about support. So I just wanted to catch everyone up about the stuff that I've found a lot of success with. And this, I was pretty spot on, I think, with a lot of the preseason and what happened. A couple of people or a couple of things have shaken up a bit differently, but I think I was, I was pretty close. I was really happy with that. That I was able to hopefully help people out a bit of the preseason. Okay, so let's talk about uh, optimal picks here. So as always, with my tier list, uh, if you haven't been to the channel before, I just do the top 15 champions, and we just break it up into five for tier one, five for tier two, five for tier three. I just think a lot of those tier lists out there that are like, you know, here's 10 champions in tier one, and here's 20 champions in tier two, it's just not really that helpful if you're saying that like almost everything is good. So that's why I always keep it, no matter what's going on, I keep it at five for each tier, just to kind of let you know... Um, what's going on there and then i have a little mini google doc here as well that we'll use for each one where i show you uh recommended runes recommended items then i also have a rating system one to five one means the champion is one of the worst at that specific task for a support and five means the champion is one of the best at that task so lane pressure is just how likely is it that the champion um, can get priority in the lane Kill threat is how likely is it that the champion is going to be able to get force a kill, particularly during the laning phase or early skirmishing. Safety is how safe is the champion, especially from ganks in the early game. Scaling is how well does the champion perform over time. And reliability is how how likely is it that someone can perform at a high level on this champion over many games. So part of that is how consistent are they in terms of their skill shots and decision making. Um, is some of that going to be difficult? And then also how well does the champion fit into the meta overall? Do they complement a lot of popular picks? Are they countered by a lot of popular picks in the meta? So that's that's what we do with that. Okay, um, so for Soraka in general, there are a few things that make Soraka really strong. And I know for the last few tier lists, I've spent like 15 minutes on just Soraka. So I'm going to make it a little bit faster. But once again, we might have a lot of new people just because the, the season's starting up here. So I just want to explain really quickly because she has been the dark horse by far the preseason. And I predicted that early on. Um, just nobody talks about her. A lot of tier lists are like mentioning Janna because Janna has had a high win rate for a long time. But people just really overlook Soraka and a lot of it is they just haven't paid attention to the changes over time and the changes specifically to what's been going on in the early game meta. 
during the preseason. But what, part of what makes her so strong was a change that they made kind of in the back half of last season with her Q to where um, it heals for a lot more. This is a lot of self-healing, and it's a very efficient ability. It's on a fairly low cooldown early on. Eight seconds for a harassment ability is pretty low when you consider something like um, Rakan's Q, I think, is like 12 seconds. Yumi's Q is like 12 or 13 seconds. Senna's Q is 15 seconds. It can be reduced by auto attacks. But you see what I'm saying? It's it's pretty. Um, it's a pretty short cooldown. And it doesn't really cost much mana at all, so you're not hurt as much by the mana nerfs. Now, they are putting uh, mana regen back on the items for this patch, and they are putting health regen back on the items. Now, in exchange for that, they are nerfing the Tier 3 version of the items on a lot of these. So with uh, Bulwark of the Mountain, they are knocking off 15 AP, which is about 300 gold worth of AP. They're knocking off 9 AD off of the Pauldrons. That's another 300 gold worth. Um... Black Mist Scythe also. Now, this is losing 10 AP and uh, 50 health. So that's going to be like four, between 400 and 450 gold loss there. And the same thing with Frostfang, between 400 and 450 gold loss there. Uh, now, with Frostfang, though, if you're an Athenes user, the 100% mana regen does convert over to 20 AP. So you're actually not losing anything late game assuming that you buy a themes on holy grail in your first couple of items by the time you complete this so that's one of those sneaky like not really a nerf kind of things just straight up above for frostfang users um so i think that most enchanters are going to go back to frostfang soraka is still kind of a question mark because she does benefit from the extra health regen in the early game and she is someone who gets particularly hard targeted and dove a lot and she really needs that health to help her out a little bit with survivability um so we'll see as far as Soraka goes. But anyway, she uh, this ability is just perfect, you know, pretty much for early on. You land it, it gets a little bit of poke in there. It provides a lot of healing. It gives you bonus movement speed. And whenever you heal an ally with your W, it also gives them the bonus movement speed and it heals them for a ton. And I mean, a lot of extra healing. So even if you only get like maybe three points of this in the early to mid game, that's an extra 100 heal that you give somebody. So if you have like three points in Star Call and three points in Astral Fusion in the mid game, that's going to be uh, 240 with a 1.1 AP ratio, a 240 heal. So that's absolutely massive. It's also AOE, so you can hit multiple people in a team fight. That usually doesn't matter as much. The damage is a bit lower than it used to be, but handing out that movement speed is clutch. Uh, and you can even wave clear with this a little bit early on. If you hit the back line of caster minions, it allows you to push pretty quickly to rotate for scuttles or skirmishes or dragons or deeper vision or whatever. So it's a very, very powerful ability that scales really well as the game goes on. So that's awesome. And then her heal is something that's fantastic as well. And the major thing about this is when you get this leveled up, it's a two second cooldown. That is massive. When you compare a Janna Shield at max rank, it's going to be 12 seconds. It can realistically get reduced to 8 seconds if you hit two pieces of CC with Janna, but that's conditional, and that's still nowhere close to 2 seconds. So that's massive. Like a Nami uh, W is about 10 seconds, and then a Sona W, I think you can get that down to like 4 seconds with CDR. So Sona's kind of close, but this is such a massive. It's 200 single target heal that gets empowered by the Star Call as well. So it's just a massive, massive amount of heal. If they don't have Grievous Wounds, you're going to completely obliterate people in team fights. It's just going to be impossible to kill anybody. Especially some of the champions that are becoming really popular right now will um, run the Spirit Visage. Vlad is still very good in this meta. You've got Mundo, who's pretty good in this meta. Really, anyone that's ta that's a tank, that's intelligent, that notices they have a Soraka that's performing pretty well on their team is going to get a Spirit Visage if you're looking for a magic resist item. And that's going to give you 30% extra plus healing and shielding. So... It just has really good itemization. Also, because it has such a high base amount of heal, that allows you to take Mikhail's Crucible as a utility item early on, which is something that you don't see a lot of people do, but it's very, very powerful because it adds plus 20% healing and shielding and a free cleanse, like a free Quicksilver Sash for anyone on your team that needs it every couple of minutes, which is massively powerful. It also translates all of your mana regen over into health regen. So... It's a super strong item, and I've had people say, well, why don't you just go Athenes, this and that, and I've done the math in past videos. The Mikhail's, uh, especially early on, is going to give you more plus healing and shielding than the Athenes will. Because Athenes is, now, that might change a little bit. If you take Frostfang, 
there's a possibility that Athens is going to be back on par um, <clears throat> with uh, with Mikhail's, right? Because <coughs> her ratios aren't insane early on. You have a 0.6 here. So if you get um, 60 AP off of Athens early on, you just buy Athens first. It's going to have a flat, basically 50 on it. And then you get the extra 10 from Frostfang. The 50% mana regen converts over to 10 AP off of Frostfang. Then 60% of that, 60% of 60 is going to be like, what, 35 or something? Uh, let me pull out my calculator here. Um, 0.6 times 60, 36. So you're going to get 36 extra uh, heal off of this versus... Now, if you don't have a lot of points in this, then that is going to be a lot stronger. But once this gets kind of maxed out to 200 and you have 20% of that, then that's going to give you 40, right? So... Um, so it's going to be four more heal on that if you have a Mikhail's. And then I think even off of this, the total self-heal of 140 um, times 0.2 is going to give you a 28 heal versus 50% of 60 is going to be 30. So that one off of the Q, you will get a little bit more healing off of it. But I mean, the bottom line here is that it's, it's very, very similar. People think you're losing a lot by not getting the AP off of um, Athens, but they're they're very very similar to each other, especially in the early game. The big thing with Mikhail's though is that it does apply to um, revitalization as well, which is going to give you up to fifteen percent extra plus healing and shielding, and it's also going to apply if the enemy has their own like buffs that increase their healing, particularly Spirit Visage. That thirty percent extra that you get off the of Spirit Visage doesn't have an AP ratio, but that is going to well. Actually, that's not going to benefit from Mikhail's unless you yourself have that. But it does also heal yourself for quite a lot um, as well. So a, a big ticket thing too, Re Revitalize is huge. But then also um, the, um, I'm going to blank it out on the name here, the, the AOE heal item that you can get uh, is going to benefit from that. Dang it, let me just look that up real quick. I don't know why I'm... Redemption. Sorry, it's a little, uh, still a little tired. I slept in a bit this morning. Redemption. So Redemption has no AP ratios on it, right? If you, um, if you get Athene's Unholy Grail. Now, Athene's does benefit from Redemption in the sense that the 150% mana regen does convert over to um, extra AP, right? So that's going to be 30 extra AP off of Redemption. So that is nice. It does have that in terms of scaling. But the raw hit that you get off of Redemption gets triple the value off of your plus healing and shielding power. So you're going to be getting um, an extra 60% heal on this. And so in the mid game, you know, that 190 is going to be healing for, you know, an extra like 90 per person. So if you hit like three people with this, that's like a 270 burst heal. So both items are very good, but I think sometimes people are scared to get the Mikhail's. It is harder to use because the Thien's just does its thing, right? You just go about, you damage people, um, you get extra heal off of your pre-mitigation damage, so that's nice. But Mikhail's is an item that really you have to make good use of this active. And one thing that a lot of people forget about is it does give 40% bonus movement speed for two seconds also. So not only does it cleanse most pieces of CC other than suppression, but it also improves the movement speed of your ally for 40 seconds and makes them immune to slows for 40 seconds. So sometimes this item can make the difference even if someone hits somebody with a small slow and you're able to do the McHale's just to give them that extra burst of speed. Like a, a common thing would be like Misfortune pressing an E on somebody to slow them down so that your ally can't run in and catch her. You can just cast the McHale's. It's going to make them immune to the slow and give them the 40% to be able to run down the Misfortune and kill her. Um, or if Ash is trying to kite somebody, you know, backwards with her auto attacks, you can just cast the McHale's on them, boom, run right through it. Someone needs to run through a, a Thresh ultimate to get to a priority target, boom, you can use McHale's to do that. So it does have a higher skill cap. It requires a little bit better positioning so that you can get close enough to cleanse. But if you use it correctly, it's massive, massive. Especially if your AD carry doesn't have to buy a Quicksilver Sash. You're saving them 1,300 gold, which is another BF sword they could buy. And that's going to give them a lot of extra damage if you can hook them up with that Mikhail's. So you don't always have to go Mikhail's. I find myself getting it a lot of times. And with if you choose to go Frostfang now, then you know maybe Athens is pretty good as well. But... Soraka is the one champion that I think you can comfortably rush a Mikhail's a lot of the time. 
and still be <clears throat> and still feel really good about it. And a lot of that is just because she has such a high cooldown, um, or such a low cooldown rather on her heal. So you're not going to be damaging people a lot to charge up your uh, Athenes. Like you're going to be doing some. You, you'll auto attack. You'll throw your star call. But it's really not that much damage that Soraka is going to be doing in order to maximize those charges off of Athenes. Versus someone like Asona, every time she presses Q and auto attacks, it's going to be a fully charged um, Athenes Unholy Grail, right? Because the Q is going to hit two people. Your auto attack is going to be empowered a lot of the time to hit extra people. Or like Nami, you know, when it's bouncing around, her waves bouncing around, it's stacking up and distributing charges of the Athenes. So I just think that other enchanters use Athenes a lot better than Soraka. It's not terrible on her. I just think that there is an argument for Mikhail's being um, a pretty strong item versus most enchanters. You don't want to rush it unless you absolutely have to because of their CC. But especially in a world where we're seeing a lot of Leonas, a lot of Nautiluses, um, Varus, Ash, like there's a lot of CC going around out there right now. And so playing a champion that can rush Mikhail's comfortably without sacrificing very much is a huge boon. And I think that helps Soraka out a lot. The other thing that helps Soraka is this ultimate is just clutch. You know, anywhere on the map you can turn a fight early on. I mean, plus 225 extra HP at level 6 if they're below 40% health is huge early on. I mean, that's going to be like a third of somebody's health bar. So if there's a fight breaking out top lane in a really swingy matchup like a Darius or a Riven or whatever, um, you could use this Soraka ult to swing that fight and maybe turn around the entire lane. Not to mention it's extremely strong in team fights because it can't miss. It just heals everybody for like a, a billion health uh, early on. So I think all of these things make Soraka really, really good, uh, especially the extra movement speed that she gets. It used to only be, um, it used to be a lot less movement speed. I think it used to be conditional, like you had to be running towards allies or away from enemies or something like that. But now it's just whenever you land this Q, it just always lasts. And they uh, like undercover buffed up the movement speed as well sort of halfway through the, the end of last season there. Um, they did a lot of low-key stuff that people just really didn't notice or pick up on a lot. There was also a bug there where she wasn't healing herself for 40% extra healing, so she was so much more vulnerable in the all-ins. Um, but yeah, they increased the damage there on 915, 917. That was a huge bug fix. And then over here on 910, that was when they uh, changed her movement speed a little bit so that she got a lot more movement speed. But anyways, okay, so I said I wasn't going to talk about Soraka for 15 minutes. Talked about her for about 15 minutes. But let's go ahead and move on a little bit so that um, we can get some more champions in here. I will say that, um, you know, definitely consider trying her out. Oh, a final thing about the runes and the items. I really like the Guardian build. Now, this is something that is a bit different as well. You'll see a lot of people going like an airy Scorch build with like Mana Flow Band. Um, I've even seen some people go Nimbus Cloak so that whenever you activate your barrier or you flash, you get a lot of extra movement speed. That's okay. That does give you some extra defense, but I still like the Guardian build. Um, it just gives you a lot more burst um, shielding on yourself, especially. Remember that Aerie can never shield you. It only shields allies. And that extra movement speed is really clutch too, both for your AD carry and for you. So I just find that, in general, if you don't die immediately at the start of a fight as Soraka, then you're probably going to win the fight most of the time. So this just helps you survive a lot more. Because once you have Guardian plus Barrier, if you're taking Relic Shield for the extra health, um, and you can use your ult to heal yourself, use your Q to heal yourself, it becomes decently challenging to burst out of Soraka unless someone is extremely fed. So that's why I like Guardian. Also, I just don't think you have to feel the pressure to poke a lot in the early game with Aerie and Scorch. You can do that, but if your AD carry is just playing behind you, which has been happening all the time to me in the last couple of days, even at Diamond, I'll be up there harassing a Soraka, you know, trying to land Qs, autos, while the enemy's trying to last hit. And then I'll have, like, a Caitlyn standing, you know, 200 units behind me, just last hitting minions and never even, like, thinking about auto-attacking the enemy. So it's kind of sad, but that's just the reality of the situation is a lot of AD carries even at low diamond and definitely below that, just are not going to apply pressure. They're just going to sit there and auto attack, especially if they're auto filled. And so you're not going to get a lot of value out of your Scorch and Aerie. You're not going to force the enemy into bad backs and you're going to be sacrificing a much stronger mid game that you could have off of taking something like Guardian, Ghost Poro, and Ulti Hunter. 
Because you have to have Revitalize, like, 100%. That rune's just broken on Soraka. It gives so much extra healing. So you have to have Revitalize, and then usually you're going to go Bone Plating or Conditioning. So that's not negotiable. What it comes down to is, do you want Guardian, Font of Life, Ghost Poro, and Ulti Hunter? Or would you rather have Airy, Mana Flow Band, something like Absolute Focus, and Scorch? And I would much rather have the Ghost Poro and Ulti Hunter just so strong in the mid-game once you get those charged up. They give you so much power, so much value. And then Font of Life is okay. It's not amazing, but it does allow you to, um, if you want to go Ardent Sensor, if you have multiple auto attackers on your team, it does allow you to distribute that a lot easier to more people on your team. Because if you just hit the enemy with a Q, anyone that auto attacks that target is going to get the Ardent Sensor buff. So you can put it on everyone anyways with the redemption and with your ult and things like that. But now you don't have to feel forced to use those abilities early just to get the extra offense out of um, Ardent Sensor. And then recommended items. I like Ionians, Mikhail's. If they don't have a lot of CC on their team, you can go with Thien's, especially if you want to go Frostfang. Frostfang is going to give you better mana regen early, but you're going to be a lot more susceptible to all ends. And it's probably going to be harder to charge up to get that four ward item in the mid game. I haven't tested it. But I suspect you're going to be probably three to five minutes later on that four-word item in the mid-game, which could be a big deal. However, if you are going Athenes, then the, the Frostfang probably makes a little bit more sense because you're going to get extra value out of that mana regen. And then I think either Mikhail's or Ardent Sensor. Now, another thing that I've been getting as well that I think is really good on her is Shirelia's. And the really nice thing about that item is it builds out of the exact same items as Redemption. So after you finish either your Mikhail's or your um, Athene's Unholy Grail, then you can just go ahead and build your Forbidden Idol and your, I think it's, I forgot what the, um, the health item's called, the Crystalline Bracer. Um, and then you can decide, okay, do I need more team fight power? Are we actually fighting real 5-on-5 five -five team fights where Redemption's going to shine? Or do I want to go for Shirelia's for better skirmishing, better engage? So if you have a really fed like Olaf or Darius or one of those kind of meatballs that needs to get in there, then Shirelia's might be a better call, right? Versus <clears throat> if the enemy team has a lot of team fighting stuff, you know, they have a Rumble, a Cannon, a Vlad, or something like that, <coughs> and they're going to be doing a lot of AoE, um, then you might want to go for a Redemption instead. <clears throat> okay, let's go, on, go ahead and move on to a non-Soraka uh, champion here. I still think she's going to be super strong. She's rising up. People are banning her more. Um, she's really, really good right now. Okay, Nautilus, I think I have it number two. Almost every tier list is going to have it number one. <coughs> this champion's still just really strong. He has a ton of CC. Um, they did nerf him a little bit near the back half of the season where his level six, he doesn't do as much damage. Uh, they took 50 off, and it that does make it a little bit harder to all-in kill people, but... At level 6, but at the same time, he, you know, he just has so much going for him. He has a really fat hitbox on that dredge line. It's very easy to land. You can actually escape if you're getting ganked by dredge lining over to a tower as well. So that helps out a ton. His auto attacks still apply a huge root. Um, his shielding, his protection is on the weak side compared to a lot of tanks, but it's still okay. It's not terrible. Riptide, this is something that does separate him from Leona and some of these other engaged tanks, the Blitzcranks, the Leonas, the Pikes, is he actually has pretty good wave clear with his Riptide. So his E can set up the minions. Obviously, you're not going to be last hitting yourself, but you can set them up for your allies to last hit them really well. So if you're trying to push, get priority, go get Scuttle, go get Dragon or whatever, you can use that Riptide set up, especially the back line for just the Caitlyn to Q straight through it or the Jen to grenade it or whatever. So having that wave clear is valuable as a support even though you're not actually going to be getting a lot of the last hits. It's pretty handy. And then, of course, you have Death Charge, 120-second cooldown for some reason. It's a really, really powerful ult. can hit multiple targets, so you can comfortably cast this on the back line with 825 range. It's going to hit them. There's no way they dodge it unless they have um, Stopwatch or some other invulnerability effect. So they're going to get knocked up. And the thing is, it knocks up all of everyone as well that it goes through. So you can hit two or three people a lot of times with this jet death charge, and it can completely swing a team fight. And it's a very, very long stun. So they're up in the air for one second, and minimum at level six, it's a two-second stun that's unavoidable. If you get to level 16, which is rare, but if you do get there, then it's a three-second point-click stun that can hit multiple targets in a team fight. Like, that's ridiculous. And it still does a lot of damage. I mean, they took 50 off. But it's still ridiculous. You know, at level 11, 275 with a 
AP ratio. Now, you don't usually go AP on him, but it's still, he just does so much. And this Riptide actually does quite a bit of damage. I mean, look at this. If you're hitting people with multiple waves, which is not that hard, each person that you hit, and this is what you max first, so at level 9, it's 350 damage. What? Something that's on a 5-second cooldown that can hit multiple targets? That's spammable? Like, and applies a slow? He's just, he's overloaded. I mean, he was played a lot even in pro recently. He's the second most played at the Kespa Cup, the Korean Winter Tournament. Um... around he's got he only had like a 50 percent win rate part of that is because tom kench does hard counter him um and kench was played in pro a little bit but even in solo queue he's gonna have a really high win rate still you know 52 percent. so he did drop he was like 54 percent, and so was leona at the end of last season i predicted they fall about two percent they fell about two percent i said the enchanters would go up about two percent enchanters are now up about one and a half or two percent but he's still really, really good, and he's banned a lot. So I do think they will nerf this champion. He's not quite at the threshold where they're defining when you nerf. They do have that threshold spelled out for you if you're ever curious about that in a dev blog called Champion Balance Framework. Um, so you can look that up on your own. But basically, if he doesn't have over 35% uh, ban rate with a 52.5% win rate and like platinum and lower, then he's not going to get banned. And then as you go up, they talk about these different thresholds as well. So, or he, he has to have a 45% ban rate in Challenger, which he doesn't have yet, or in Pro Play, he has to be picked or banned 80% um, of the time over a couple of patches. So he's on the edge of that, right? He's got like a 33% ban rate instead of a 35% ban rate um, when we look at these things. So he's, he's right on the cusp, and the Challenger ban rate, I think, is like 40 like the Masters Plus here. Look at support. He's at 40, but it has to be 45. So he's got a huge spotlight on him. Everybody's watching him. Um, so we'll see. I, I think if they do nerf him, I think they would most likely nerf the cooldown on his ult. This is what they did with Rakan. So they would probably make his ult like 130 or 140. Um, that would probably be the best thing they could do to try to balance him out a little bit so he'd still be really strong at all ends he just couldn't do it as often or they could nerf this to bring this back down to 0.5 in early levels 0.5 root instead of a 0.75 because they gave him this extra 0.25 somewhere during the last season he got several buffs um so we'll see what they end up doing he's not getting nerfed on this patch so go ahead and take advantage of that if you want um i would go aftershock demolish bone plating unflinching for the extra cc reduction and then I think uh, Ghost Poro Ulti Hunter, he does have okay AP ratios. I mean, his death charge is nice. Um, his E is okay. His Q has a 0.9. So he can make use of the Ghost Poro AP. You can also go something like Stopwatch into Cosmic Insight or Stopwatch Biscuits. He can turn that Stopwatch eventually into a Gargoyle Stoneplate if you want to. So that's a build that's kind of popular. You could also do like Hex Flash with him. So there are some other options. I just think that the Ghost Poro and Ulti Hunter is really nice. Ulti Hunter does offset the um, the nerf to the CDR on the uh, support items, so that is pretty handy. So I still think he's going to be really strong. Mobility Boots, um, Relic Shield, and then just Zeke's Knight's Vow and Locket. If you're really far ahead or you have multiple auto attackers on your team and they just don't have enough damage to kill you, you can go for Ardent Sensor if you take Font of Life instead of Demolish because your E is going to slow everyone in an AoE. And whenever people, um, I'm actually going to do font because I think roaming rather than auto attacking plates is going to be better a lot of the time. So font is going to give you a little bit more healing effect, but it, that can be really nice with um, Ardent Sensor. You could, in theory, if you're mega rich, go for something like a Leandre's as well because that would apply the slow and the burn to everybody. But I really wouldn't do that unless you're facing a ton of tanks and the fights are going to last a super long time. So, you know, don't out, don't overthink it. Most of the time, just get Zeke's Knight's Vow. Um, but in some circumstances, maybe Ardent Sensor, maybe. If you have a really fed AD carry, you have like a 5-0 and o vein or something like that. Because uh, he does like the stats, you know. He does have a shield, so he benefits from the plus healing and shielding. He does like the move speed. The AP is pretty decent, as we said. And you do have a low cooldown AoE slow that can apply the um, Ardent Sensor passive if you take Font of Life. So, it's an optional thing, but you're going to be much, much squishier if you take that. So, you know, be careful. 
because the shield itself um, does not have uh, any sort of AP ratio on it. Okay, um, <coughs> so Nautilus is still going to be really good. Now, I think that Rakan is, believe it or not, very sleeper on this patch. A lot of people do not have him rated very highly. Most other tier lists, and I do look at um, several other tier lists out there. Most of them, because I always try to bring you guys, you know, the most up-to-date, like, best information. So I try to look at multiple perspectives. Um, what am I looking is this support? Okay. Um, wait, what? That can't be right. What? Platinum Plus. Oh, it changed. Oh, it's 10.1 over the last couple of days. What? Didn't we, weren't we just looking at this? What? That, what did I press? Okay, so maybe that's just a one, a one day sample size. Sorry, that, that just, okay. So like in one day, so Soraka didn't have a good day or whatever. I don't think. I mean, she was down four percent, but that's such a low sample size because the new patch has only been out for like half a day or something like that. But anyways, I don't. Oh, Rakan, Rakan. Yeah, so he's got an okay win. It's like fifty one percent win rate. But just a lot of people have him very low. I mean, he is still the most versatile support in the game. He's just phenomenal, you know, in every ELO bracket. He's good against um, assassins. He's decent against tanks. He does outscale. And a lot of times, he, people wonder, well, why does Rakan outscale? Because he's a shielder. He's an enchanter. And he has a really good ratio on this shield. I mean, it's a 280 base when you double shield somebody. And it's a 1.6 ratio because each shield has a, um, a 0.8. So that just gives him so much versatility with his itemization. He basically has a similar engage profile to something like a Leona and a Nautilus, like really good, high consistency engage most of the time. And he also has like the shields of a Janna. So those two combined make him an extremely dangerous champion because he can get, you know, Zeke's early on, which is super common on him. But after that, he can go Shirelia's, he can go Redemption, he can go Ardent Censor. Sometimes he even goes Athene's. I've even gone Righteous Glory on him before. I mean, he can build almost any item because he is such a, a great hybrid of an engaged champion plus a shield champion. And he's so mobile too, which just opens up a lot more um, versatility to your play style. So if you get mobility boots, one huge thing people underestimate about him is just how good his vision game is. Because you can go deep into the enemy jungle if you get priority in your lane and place like really high quality wards on their camps. Because if they ever come at you, you can probably get away with your W, right? And so you effectively have like three dashes. You have your W plus two E props, and you can speed yourself up with the quickness if you have to really get away. Um, so he's just super, super mobile. That helps him out with his vision game. That helps him out a ton with his positioning. Um, and just, like, his engage range is massive, too, especially on ganks, because you can E over to an ally uh, for that 700 range, and then you can um, W off of that. So you can effectively have, like, a 1,300 range on your engage. Or you can R and run up closer to get an engage. So there's just so many different things and different combos you can do with him. Someone trying to hard engage on your ADC, no problem. Activate quickness, E over to them. That's going to trigger Guardian as well as give you a really big shield on them. They're going to be charmed off of your quickness. You can knock them up with your W after that and then put one more shield on them with your battle dance. And while you're starting that, if you have redemption, you can go ahead and throw a redemption. So that's going to land by the time your CC falls off. So there are just so many different tools in your kit that you can do. Um, you can even like hard engage. He's one of the only champions where you can R and then like flash W, hard engage, knock out their AD carry, like allow your team to dive them, and then an enemy assassin's trying to run at your AD carry. You can E back over to them, charm them on the way back with your ult, and just double shield them to pull them through that. So he can simultaneously just do like almost everything in the fight at the same time. He can engage and peel at the exact same time versus if you go in if your positioning is on point but if you go in with um someone like a nautilus or a leona you go in you know an assassin pops out from behind a wall or a flanker you know comes running at your ad carry you can't really do anything about that because you're already in and there's no way you're getting out once you go in most of the time so it just 
he's just a lot more forgiving and flexible with his positioning with his items even with his runes i think that guardian's the best right now but the secondaries you know there's a lot of debate what you can do with those secondaries i personally like the ulti hunter and uh ghost poro i think those are phenomenal um on him but you know you could also go for a stopwatch cosmic insight if you want to you could probably go gargoyle stone plate if you're really afraid they're going to blow you up i've never really got that item on him but it is a possibility um some people might still go for presence of mind and the legend tenacity rune I don't like that as much because it doesn't affect CDR on your ult anymore. It just gives you mana, and he doesn't really have a lot of mana problems, typically, unless the fights are really, really long. So, there's a lot of flexibility there. But yeah, I just I love him so much. I mean, he has such great... Um, he's just good at pretty much everything. His laning phase, like his poke, is definitely a little suspect. His Q is pretty terrible after all the nerfs to it. But he still has his W for engage. So you can engage, you can fight if your ADC is on point, if they want to be aggressive, if they want to chill... You know that's okay too. You can scale up with your shield, with your shield, um, or you can roam and try to make a play mid lane. So that, or you can get deep vision in the enemy jungles. There's a lot of different ways you can react to different game states and how your allies are performing. And you can get a Shirelia's too. So you know <clears throat> that's one thing too. Is like you can play around your win conditions really well. It's like maybe you were thinking about getting a Zeke's, but your AD carries like zero and three early on. So you can turn that Glacial into um, a Righteous Glory or something like that and then hard engage on the enemy team, get that slow, allow your team to catch up. Or maybe you were thinking about going for a Redemption, so you got Forbidden Idol. Or maybe you were thinking about going for Ardent Sensor. So you got Forbidden Idol, and then all of a sudden um, your Darius just got three kills top lane, and so you're like, wait a minute, I need to get a Shirelia's because I can boost him into the enemy team to kill people. Right? Or maybe your Rumble's really far ahead. Maybe they're 5-0, and oh, so you got that Forbidden Idol. You were going to go Ardent Sensor, but now you're thinking, hey, we can force team fights around Dragon and Baron because our Rumble's so strong and he's such a great team fighter. I'm going to go ahead and get Redemption instead. So there's just so many different like ways that you can adapt um, if you're thinking and playing intelligently. Um, but you can use Rakan, so I think he's super strong. I think he's, I think he's pretty much always the best support in the game if you're really good on him. But... Not everyone is. Not everyone likes Rakan. He does take some practice. Not because his mechanics are super hard. They're, they're really not that hard, his mechanics, but it's just because you have a lot of decisions, different ways you can navigate all of the fights and different kinds of item builds and sort of macro approaches you can take to the game. So just learning how to optimize all of those decisions can definitely take some practice. I do offer coaching sessions for anyone that wants coaching sessions out there. 25 bucks. Um, or you can just watch some Rakan coaching sessions if you want. If you go through my coaching playlist, we have several Rakan videos in there. And I'll play him a, a decent amount on stream too. So just stop by the stream if you want to know more about him. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have as well. Okay, but you can go Ionian boots. I actually, I've been liking mobility boots. I go back and forth on that. The Ionians are nice because you do like that in-combat movement speed because you do need to reposition a lot while your ult's active. Remember, with mobility boots, when you're in combat, you lose the movement speed. You basically go down to brown boot movement speed. And you do really well with the CDR on both your ult and um, the CDR on your uh, on your summoners as well. So he can really use it flash super well to make plays. And his ignite is very good, too, because you can force fights and use that ignite on cooldown to try to make plays. So Ionians are very good in certain situations, but mobility boots, the biggest thing is they help you out so much with your vision control because you can get into the enemy jungle, get those deep wards, and rotate and get back to your lane um, a lot faster. So probably mobility boots. Relic shield, I would stick with this. You could try to go for frost fang if you want, but I think it's just too risky. It's too hard to poke with Rakan if your AD carry is a turkey or just like not having a good game or is just super scared. It's hard to get a lot of safe poke off. So I think Relic Shield is just a lot more stable. Unless you're duoed with someone. Um, and then Zeke's. Typically, you know, like I said, the items are um, very versatile. But I think um, right now, Zeke's, Shirelia, or I'll say, or Redemption. That's really, uh, that's really handy. And then, or um, Ardent Sensor. I've gone off the um, 
the Knights Vow a little bit there. It's just not like super efficient. If they have a ton of 80 on their team, the Knights Vow might be okay. But I think this is a really good trifecta of items to consider just because you can get a Forbidden Idol and build it into any of these. So once you complete your Zeke's, just get a Forbidden Idol and then just feel out how the game's going over the next, you know, three or four minutes and then you can adjust. Okay, but yeah, Rakan's going to be really strong. Uh, the last few here will go through a little bit quicker. Um, Zyra's okay. She did get some changes on this patch in terms of uh, a, a little bit more slow if she puts down two uh, melee plants. But the melee plants aren't very good because they don't reach very far. So like that might be good for single target, all-in burst combos. Maybe the double grasping root's okay if you hit somebody with it. But in team fights, I don't think it's going to be as good just because you're not going to have as much range. If you do go the double gra like if you do put out a lot of grasping roots instead and you try to go for the big slow you may not have to go rylize you might be able to just go like leandries merlinomicon or something like that and still get the full value out of the leandries because your e applies the slow and you don't need rylize for the extra damage um so we'll see zyra is pretty good right now i was a little disappointed playing her in um i tried her out in low diamond and it it feels a little rough just because her e is on such a long cooldown it's a 12 second cooldown if you ever miss it, you get punished hard. So you're kind of relegated just to trying to poke with your Q. And since you don't get the extra damage off of Frostfang anymore, it is kind of hard to poke people out. A lot of AD carries are also taking um, the Lifesteal Rune Bloodline and or uh, Fleet Footwork in the case of Caitlyn. But a lot of them are switching over to Bloodline, like your Misfortunes. Um, I think Jen might be going for blood like he goes for fleet and then he might be going for bloodline as well so a lot of them aren't taking the alacrity the attack speed because a lot of the 80 carries are kind of like burst type of champion some of the best 80 carries right now like your misfortune um your gen aphelios a lot of and aphelios has his own built-in healing as well with his um little uh whatever the the lifesteal gun that he has i forgot what the name of it is but basically there's there's quite a bit of lifesteal out there and then you also have soraka as well who can lifesteal, so a lot of the AD carries are going to have more lifesteal than they have in the past, which means that your poke is not going to be as valuable. It still is nice, but it's not as strong as it has been in past metas, so that can be re really rough. Misfortune specifically is very good against Zyra, historically, because she doesn't have a way to run out of Misfortune's ult. She just kind of dies, and like the she's just very vulnerable to the slow. She gets outranged. She can get poked hard by the Q, so, now, usually Misfortune support has dominated Zyra, but even Misfortune AD carry can be a really tough cover for Zyra, and Misfortune is the strongest AD carry right now. Jin is also not a lot of fun, because the, the grenades can add up to be a lot of poke for you as well, and then his ultimate, you don't have a lot of good ways to dodge that either. So, it's kind of a tough meta right now for Zyra in general. She is still pretty good against things like Nautilus, like Leona, because she can throw out a ton of damage. If they try to engage, she can counter-engage. Um, and sometimes the AD carry will, if they see like your AD carry get engaged on by Leona, they will stop paying attention to you and just try to walk up and hit the person that Leona engaged on. So then that might allow you to all in with the E and blow them up. Because Misfortune doesn't have a good way to dodge your E if she gets close enough. And the same thing with Jen. Um, Lucian's also a nightmare, by the way, for Zyra, because he can take lifesteal if he wants to early on, but he can dodge your E so easily with his dash and then go in and punish you hard for a lot of burst damage. So she is good. I think she's a lot better at gold and lower where you have a lot more potential to all in, where people don't respect your E damage or they don't respect that you might be sitting in a bush um, and they don't have vision. So you just have a lot more opportunities where you can exploit bad positioning in gold and lower with Zyra. But I still think she's she's good. She's serviceable, gold and platinum. I think she's going to be the best AP option out there. So it's pretty solid. And the fact that you can get a Morella Namicon sort of in the early mid-ish game is pretty decent against Soraka early on. Although Soraka is going to heal through most of your poke in the early game. So you're going to lose a lot of pressure. But in the mid game with the Morello, it is kind of nice because your AD carry may not have to get an Executioner's. Okay. So Zyra's good. I think Leona uh, is still going to be pretty strong as well. Now, typically, I don't I d don't put Leona as high just because Nautilus is so much better than Leona. I think, I mean, they're both good, but Nautilus just has so much more utility, so much more guaranteed hard CC off of his ult, uh, and it's so much easier to hit his hook than it is a Leona E. Leona's E does go through minions, which is great, 
but it doesn't have as much range as the hook and the hitbox is not as fat. And she doesn't have the wave clear. The E, the AoE wave clear is awesome for getting priority. And Nautilus can even take scuttles by himself a lot of times because you can root, you know, and just apply a lot of CC with your, your root, your Q, all that stuff, your E. Um, you can tear through those scuttles pretty quickly if you need to do it by yourself. Um, which, you know, that doesn't happen, obviously, a lot of times in Diamond Plus. Someone else is going to get the scuttle. But if you're hanging out in, like, gold or silver and just no one's paying attention to that scuttle, you got priority in the lane. You know, you can walk up there and get that scuttle while you're warding sometimes. So, usually I think that Nautilus is better. But the fact that Nautilus is banned so much, he's banned 33% of the time. Now, Leona's banned 21%, but I think that that leaves a lot more space where you can pick a Leona. And she's okay into Nautilus, um, because they're going to have a similar amount of CC, a similar amount of damage. So, if they have a Nautilus and you just want to try to fight fire with fire, Leona can be okay. So, she can engage through the minion wave, which is a pretty good perk. And her ultimate um, has a really long range and a very short cooldown. It's only a 90-second cooldown versus Nautilus's cooldown is 120 seconds. So that's going to give you more opportunities to roam and to potentially make more plays. So she's okay. She's just a lot riskier. Uh, she has to go all the way in for the hard engage. Nautilus kind of meets him halfway whenever he hits the hook. And Nautilus can hook terrain or hook towers to try to get out of sticky situations, whereas Leona has no escapes. So if you have a super dominant lane, you have like a Draven or a Misfortune or a Jen, and they have a really weak lane, then you can go up um, and apply a lot of pressure. Now with her, you want to try to zone a lot of times instead of hard push because you don't have the wave clear. So that is going to hurt your macro game quite a bit. So she's very good like in lane at pressuring and potentially forcing kills, zoning people off of minion waves. But she's going to have a harder time pushing in to go get deep vision, contest dragons, go roam to middle. She can do it. It's just the wave clear is not always there to help her out with that like it would be with Nautilus. So <clears throat> that is one thing to keep in mind with her. But she's still going to be really good. Okay, and then uh, Janna is another one that I think is really strong. She could slot into Tier 2. I thought of putting her in instead of Zyra, but realistically, you know, a lot of people watching this video are probably going to be gold and lower. Janna is still good at gold and lower. I just think Zyra is probably a little bit better. Um, but Janna is really strong right now. I mean, she scales very well, especially the champions that are building crit because the extra AD off of her shield scales super well with crit because obviously it just says it's going to be like 50 AD on their auto attacks, but if they crit... That's going to be 100 extra damage per auto attack. So her shield, if you put it on a lot of AD carries that have crit and a lot of flat AD items, then that shield's going to be putting out three or 400 damage on somebody. So that's something that a lot of people really underestimate is that Janna herself doesn't do a ton of damage, typically as far as like the DPS charts at the end of the game. But the damage she contributes off of that bonus AD with her shield is actually a very large amount. Um, you're basically giving your AD carry an extra, like, BF sword and a half a lot of the time. So you're giving them, you know, like, 1,800 to 2,000 gold uh, off of that shield. So she's really good, and she has a lot of peel. The Monsoon can peel back a lot of hard engage. The Tornado is very good against hard engage. So historically, especially in the mid-game, if you don't fall too far behind, she is pretty good against things like Leona, Nautilus, Zack. She's awesome against Zack. A lot of enchanters have a really hard time with him. you got to knock him out of the air with a displacement and she has two forms of displacement so i think she's great she can put down some early game harass if you get multiple points in zephyr and then uh some people go for like a full-on like scorch plus comet plus um cheap shot and stuff like that like you can really throw down a lot of harass but once again like i explained earlier with zyra a lot of that harass goes to waste if your 80 carry is just basically afk last hitting and if the enemy has lifesteal if they go for bloodline or they have built-in lifesteal to their kit like Aphelios. Or if they have an enchanter that can heal them. Sometimes you're not getting as much value out of it. So I do think a lot of times maybe finding a compromise with Aerie that does apply some pretty good poke early on but can transition into being a stronger shield later could be a good option. Now, I still am going to like the Ghost Poro and Ulti Hunter with her. Ulti Hunter is not as good with her as it is with some of the other choices just because she doesn't use this proactively as much. It's reactive. You wait on the enemy to do stuff. So, you know, having the CDR is not as insane on her because you can't force plays. But uh, it's still going to be really solid. So she scales super well later on into the game. Um, replace URL with this title. Okay. No, let's not do that. 
Um, so she can still be pretty good. Uh, you can go Ionians or Mobility Boots, depending on the situation. And then she will probably want to go back to Frostfang and then Athene's Ardent Sensor and Redemption. Um, now, you like I have tried a Guardian build with her. If you're afraid they are going to hard assassinate you, like they have a Rengar or a Kha'Zix or something, you can go a Guardian build with Font of Life, Conditioning, um, revitalize and then go for the other stuff. That's much more of a mid game build. I think that's a little bit better on Soraka because Soraka doesn't have as many self peels as Janna does. Janna can kind of protect herself a bit more with the tornado and her ult than Soraka can, so she doesn't need the guardian as much. And she um, has more consistent poke. You don't have to land Qs like with Janna. You have to land Qs or you have to put points in your E, which is terrible after the nerfs to damage on the E. Versus Janna just walks up and presses W and it does damage. So, it's up to you. I think the Guardian build can work in some situations, but it's not as much of a, a really strong build as I think um, it is on Soraka. So, she's good. The main difference is she's going to be a little bit weaker in lane than Soraka is because she doesn't have a self-heal. She can't heal her ally if your AD carry takes some um, tough poke. But she does have similar scaling later on into the game, and she uh, has a lot more resilience to Grievous Wounds. So the uh, Morella Nomicon, Executioner's Calling, all that stuff doesn't affect her shield. It does affect her ult, so that matters, but her shield's still going to be intact. It's still going to be really strong. So I think Janna is very, very good, especially if you have a crit user on your team. Okay. Um, Senna's another one. Senna did get nerfed a little bit, and she still does have a pretty high win rate. Like My thing with Senna is basically what I've just explained with a lot of other like early game poke champions is that people are just going to heal through it a lot of the time. You know, your auto attacks with your Q, your um, just a lot of stuff. They're just going to heal through your poke. And I feel like she's best in the laning phase. Like, later on, she's okay, but her items are so expensive. You're going to have to be, if you want the, um, uh, the lethality items, your Umbral is a decent costed item. It's 2,400 gold, so that that's okay. But, like, once you start getting into Ghostblade territory... It's going to be 2,900 gold. You can go Man Immune as support. I honestly have not done that that much as support. Um, it is only 2,400 gold, which is nice. The problem is, like, the tier of the Goddess build is not insane early on on her. Um, yeah, is this specifically for support? I think. It's hard for me to tell if this is AD carrier support. Um, it looks like this is probably the support preference. So yeah, a lot of people are just not, like, some people go for the Mana Mute on her, as you can see. The win rate's, like, okay on it. But yeah, most people are going to go the Umbral. And the big thing with this is it gives you a ton of extra vision control, which is really nice. So I still think you go Umbral. And if you're going Umbral first, tier is pretty terrible if you don't rush, like, tier fairly early on. So I I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I think that, like, the Mana Mute into Dustblade is really good for 80 carries playing Senna. Or Ghostblade, but for support, I think you're probably better off going like Umbral into Ghostblade. I'm not a huge fan of Athene's. It, like, this can work, but her AP ratios are so terrible. Um, it's just really rough. So, I feel like the itemization is just really pretty clunky on her, and the runes kind of are too. Like, you do get Airy, which is okay. It does apply extra poke, but her W does apply a nice form of CC. So, she's okay. Like, she's still pretty good. But her win rate is definitely, like, she lost 4% after the nerfs a couple of patches ago, which I didn't think she was going to fall that much. But she kind of did. So I think that if you if you get ahead, if you can completely slam and dominate the lane, um, then she can be very strong. But it's hard for her to force kills to pay for the expensive items like you can do with Pike, for example. He gets all that extra gold to afford those items. Um, however, it is really good laning. She is still a healer and a shielder. She does have good utility with her ultimate global presence, with her W for potential AoE, CC, and team fights. So she still has a lot of stuff. It's just her items are expensive, and I don't think she scales as well. I know that sounds crazy because she has the scaling with her ghosts and all that stuff, but it just takes her so long to come online. The items are just that she gets are just really clunky and don't have a lot of synergy with each other. So she's okay. She's still pretty good, but you have to really like crush the laning phase. And that's harder to do with a lot of people having lifesteal. Okay, Blitzcrank. Um, really solid champ right now overall. Good win rate. He's going to be banned a lot, especially at gold and lower. 
Um, once you go to silver and bronze, people just hate this champion. So he does get banned a ton. <clears throat> but he is sort of the ultimate counter to uh, Soraka and Janna. If you are consistently landing those hooks on him, it's really hard for them to get out of it, especially because they added a shield breaker. So if somebody gets hooked, that's really good against Janna. The fact that he instantly breaks the shield and then does a ton of damage. Um, sorry if my hair looks weird, too. I've got to have my wife touch that up a little bit. I went to a new barber earlier today, and I was not super pleased with the results. I'm like, dude, I'm not trendy. I'm an old professor guy. Like, He's trying to give me this like asymmetrical haircut, things like that. I don't know. I don't want to send the wrong message to students, but anyways. I just want to appear neutral, and I think that that would make it look like I was trendy I don't know. Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe I'm overthinking it. But I just want the Beatles haircut where people look at it and they're just like, man, that guy's chill and maybe a little bit old. Like, that's what I want. Um, but anyways, so he's good. My, my thing with Blitz is he's very all or nothing. I feel like he's very inconsistent, potentially. If you land that hook, you're a god. You know, you take over the game, you get a ton of kills, but that's like all he can do, right? If you miss the hook, you're extremely vulnerable. You don't contribute a lot to team fights. You don't have a lot of utility. Your itemization's not that great. Um, so that's just the thing with me, is he's so heavily dependent, his entire kit, on hitting that one ability. And I just think that... <clears throat> I just think it's really risky. But if you like him, he can work. Uh, Bard is another one. Now, Bard has been getting a bit more attention lately because of some weird builds, and more and more people have been talking about it. I was trying to find some good information on it. I could not find good information. I was watching a couple... I tried to watch one... I think he's a master level player i'm not gonna name him but he's one of those all caps youtuber guys and i was watching some guard bard gameplay but you'll notice a lot of these things look really suspicious because they'll turn the names off like they'll turn the name tags off of their champs and that's almost like a lot of these youtubers that do this and that's almost always a red flag that it's smurf gameplay which i consider to be invalid you know for like trying to you know, make a video about whether something's strong or not. That That's my opinion on it. I know people might disagree, but it's like, okay, this guy was in gold four, and I think he's at least a high diamond and master level player, like talking about how this build's really good with Bard, um, with the dead man's plate and the rapid fire cannon and things like that. It's like, okay, but like you could build anything on Bard, you know, or any other champion if you're that much stronger than other people in the game. So, anyways, I couldn't find, like, I mean, I guess I could have maybe looked a little bit harder. There probably is some challenger gameplay. There's one guy that's, like, a challenger that plays Bard with that build. But the, the thing with Bard is he almost always has, like, a pretty good win rate. Um, you know, it's it's pretty high. It's, like, 53%, so it's pretty good. But he um, he's just really weird. Like, the runes are kind of bad on him, and... Like, items aren't really that great on him either, but he has such a unique kit that he can get a lot of advantages out of it. So this is kind of the newer build that people, more and more people are trying to get with the Deadmans. Um, Deadmans is a really inefficient item in general. You do get a lot of extra movement speed off of it. Um, but, like, the, the cost itself, the 2,900 gold is so expensive. That's bringing it into kind of like the Senna or Pike territory. Um... Let me see if I can pull this up here. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get Dead Man's Plate or not. Uh, I'll just type it in here. I know there, uh, Scott on the channel has been sort of memeing about Dead Man's Plate for a long time on Janna and things like that, but it's an 80% efficient item. Just what that means is if you spend 3,000 gold on this item, then you're only getting like 2,400 gold worth of value out of it. So you're like losing 600 gold on this item, potentially. Versus if you buy Ardent Sensor, which is typically at least 200% efficient, then you're gaining 2,300 gold off of that item. So it's like a 2,600 gold swing, which is like nine kills. Pretty close. So if you buy a Dead Man's instead of an Ardent Sensor, you're spotting your enemy nine kills worth of gold efficiency. Now... This efficiency does not cover how much movement speed you could potentially get, right? If you are getting um, 79 movement speed, then it does become 105% gold efficient. So when while you're zipping around really fast before you uh, get into combat, then it does get like decent on efficiency. Not great, but decent. Um, 
and Bard doesn't have anything that scales with armor. He doesn't have anything that scales with health. So it does make you a little bit tankier. The movement speed is cute. It does give you some survivability. So I don't know. But to be fair, most items are not that good on Bard because uh, he just has no scaling. Like his R literally does not have an AP ratio or an AD ratio. It has no ratios on it. Um, neither does his E. So that's what I mean by like no scaling. Like there's just no ratios on these abilities. So it doesn't matter which item you get for the most part. And like the W is a really, really low ratio to a 0.6 on a fully charged shrine and only a 0.3 on a, a point click shrine, which is what you do a lot of times in team fights just to give people the movement speed boost. And only a 0.65 on cosmic binding. So the AP ratios are really, really low. He does have a 0.3 on the meeps and that's every meep. So if you hit people with like four meeps, it's a 1.2. So the AP ratio is okay, I guess, but and the sh the heal is obviously really low. So plus healing and shielding is not really that phenomenal either. So the items are just awful on Bard, and like you can take Electrocute, the top end guy in this video. He was copying the Challenger's build to try it out, but the top end guy did go Guardian a lot of times. But I guess I mean you know the Dead Man's does give you a little bit more resilience. It does allow you to run around the map a little bit faster, which is really good with Bard, obviously. To zip around and make more plays um and then the rapid fire cannon is the other one that people get and that's like 2600 gold that one makes a little bit more sense because it allows you to have a long range auto attack and once you get so many meeps your auto attack does apply a slow um so that will allow you to slow people to potentially land your ult so people have been using like twin shadows to get that slow off but the thing with twin shadows is it's on a, a 90 second cooldown so you're not going to be able to use it all the time. It's only every now and then you can use Twin Shadows. And typically you don't get um, Glacial Augment to buff up the Twin Shadows either. So this, I guess like the Rapid Fire Cannon is the new Twin Shadows because you can walk up. And having the extra attack speed is nice. It does allow you to fire off more um, more meeps. And having the burst off of Rapid Fire, that like the extra 120 damage, um, is pretty nice as well too. So this one is a little bit close. I mean, it's only 67% efficient, though. Like, you really, like, these items are just god-awful. Like, you're not going to be using critical strike that well either. You do get a little bit more attack speed and move speed, and you do get the extra range. So I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, that guy's a really smart bard player. He's making plays with it, um, gaining some elo. It still is not super popular, although it does have a fairly high win rate. The Rapid Fire Cannon second does have a slightly higher win rate. Um, so, I don't know. You'll have to try it out. I'm not a Bard expert. Look it up. Find out for yourself. I couldn't find a ton of great information about it. It seems too expensive to me most of the time to make it really viable. But then again, like I said, pretty much every other item is terrible on him. So if you're getting Rapid Fire instead of Twin Shadows... I mean, Twin Shadows is more gold efficient, but, like, the AP really doesn't matter also because you don't, like, get any benefit out of the AP. So maybe just having that, that slow on the auto is just more valuable over time. And just with um, Dead Man's Plate, just being able to zip around the map and, you know, show up to skirmishes faster, maybe that's more valuable than anything else you can get. So historically, most people have gone, like, Athene's Unholy Grail, which does have a higher win rate than Dead Man's Plate as a first item. A lot of people go Athene's Unholy Grail into Redemption. Because then at least Redemption, like, affects team fights a lot, you know? So you can time Redemption really well with your ult, too. If you're trying to save an ally, you can ult your ally, drop a Redemption on him. Or if you're trying to hit an enemy, you can hit him with that Redemption true damage as well. The um, 250 true damage is pretty solid, up to 250 true damage. Um, so... I don't know. I, I I would still probably err on the side of going for Athene's plus uh, Redemption. But if you want to try that other build out, you can. Anyways, we need to go a bit quicker here. Uh, I just wanted to mention Bark, so a lot of people have been asking me about that on stream. And my answer is, I don't think it's that great. But, you know, there are much better Bard players than me that are using it. So, we'll see. Okay, and then Nami. This is the other one that I guess I have to talk about for just a second here. Because she did get a buff on this patch to where um, her E now applies to spells. But I really don't think this is that big of a deal. Um, it's nice that a support is getting something that um, does apply 
or it like does work with mages a little bit better. But the fact that it only does 33% on AoE abilities, um, Tycar's blessing deal. Oh, to non-champions. Okay, actually, I missed that. Um, I missed that part of it. So that's only. So you're not allowed to give out a bunch of wave clear to people. Okay, but it does apply the full amount of damage to. Um, I thought it was 33% damage to everybody, but it's only to non-champions. Hmm. Okay. I still don't think it's going to change it that much. But um. That does make it a little bit more appealing. I mean, maybe on someone like Lucian, who, you know, has an ability that does a damage. Like, I'm trying to think of other AD carry. Like, Misfortune. But it's... The thing is, it's your next ability, not the next instance of damage from ability. So, like, Misfortune's E is not going to automatically apply three stacks. Um... Six seconds, causing her next three basic attacks or abilities to deal this much. Empowered area of effect abilities only do that much damage to basically minions. But the damage is not really like that high, you know? Because you're maxing the... First of all, you're maxing ebb and flow first, then you're maxing this second. So in the mid game, you're probably only going to have three points in this. Maybe four. So it's like 150 damage. And, like, most of the time, your AD carries are going to be auto-attacking. So, it's not like you're gaining a lot of value off of the spells. It would front-load more damage for someone who uses a lot of spells. Like, Lucian, for example, you know, the Q and then auto-attack or, like, dashboard, auto-attack, Q or whatever. Like, you would apply the damage, the burst, a little bit faster. Misfortune, you know, with your Q or with your E, you might apply it. Or, like, a Misfortune ult. I'm not sure if that would apply all three. Um, that actually might be pretty strong. Next three basic attacks or abilities to deal bonus damage. I think it's only one instance per spell, right? That's hard to say. I'll, I would have to watch that or try that in the tool. If it applies AoE to everybody, and it can apply multiple times per spell, that might actually be pretty OP with um, Misfortune's ult. If it gives um, 55 extra damage on three waves, and that hits like three people, um, then maybe that is really strong. You know, who are other champs that have like really big AoE damage uh, where that might apply and hit everybody? Misfortune's the most obvious one. Maybe um, if you had like a Ziggs AD carry or something, or uh, Lucian. Um, each deal this much. Because like those are multiple instances of damage that stack over time. It's not one ability to hit. So that'll be curious. I'm going to have to look and see. Because... If Misfortune's E applies it multiple times, or if her ult applies it multiple times, or both, that could actually be quite strong on Misfortune. And Nami's already pretty good with Misfortune, so you can land your bubble, and then she ults him, or you can ult him, and then she ults him. So there's a lot of combos that are already pretty decent with Misfortune. So, I don't know, maybe Nami does go up a couple of percentage points off of this. But I still think it would only be, like, certain specific matchups. The big problem with Nami is that her heal is so low. It's only 160 base so if you're trying to heal a single target, it just doesn't do it that well. And like the AP ratio is really low. Now, if it bounces around and hits multiple targets in a team fight, it can be really strong. But basically, she has a lot more CC than other enchanters out there with the Aqua Prison and her ultimate, you know, providing some pretty good hard CC. And then her Tidecaller's Blessing applying a slow. Um, then that can be pretty solid. So we'll see. I mean, Cass if there's a Cassiopeia bottom, like the single target with the E adding on that extra damage would be pretty nice. But I'm... Let me just... Let me look here real quick. Uh, where's... I'm just trying to think of, like, top end 80 carries. Aphelios with his flame ult, maybe? Um, that could help out a little bit. Cassio is secretly, like, a pretty strong 80 carry bottom, although she's not played that much. Ashes Q would only apply it once. Jinx's rockets, I suppose. So if they have um, 
Hurricane, Hurricane Bolts, or like Jinx's Rockets, Twitch's ult. I guess could apply it to multiple people as well. So maybe, I mean, maybe this is going to be a bit stronger than I think it is. I'm, I'm still not entirely sure. But maybe it will be a little bit stronger. So we'll see. I still think she's probably tier two is fair. Uh, I don't think she'd crack into tier one. Maybe she should be a little bit higher in tier two. But we'll see. And that's pretty much all that we have time for. We're already way over time. I wanted to make this an hour. It ended up being an hour 20. Uh, I'll just really quick zip through these last ones. Lulu, she's okay. She's uh, has really good single target buffs, but doesn't have much in the way of AOE, so she doesn't contribute as much to team fights. You can, if you do have one like hardcore single target AD carry, so something like a Kogma, Kaisa, um, Twitch to some extent, someone who benefits a lot from attack speed. Her whimsy can be really good. Her ult is good at protecting a single target from burst damage. The problem is it doesn't count as a heal. It counts as an infusion of health, so it doesn't have any scaling with plus healing and shielding. Her Q is really anemic later on in the game. Doesn't do a ton of utility. And then her shield, they have buffed it a little bit, so it's a slightly bigger shield, but it doesn't really offer a lot of utility. You can do damage with it in the laning phase. So that's nice. It does apply picks to people, which does do the on-hit damage, but overall, the fact that you have to choose between buffing up your AD carry with your W or applying a really strong polymorph CC to somebody... It's kind of a rough choice. What I think they need to do with Lulu to make her uh, more viable is put the attack speed steroid from the W on her E so that when she E's somebody, it gives them a shield and it increases their attack speed and applies picks to them. That would be so much better. And then you could use your W just for the polymorph on someone on the enemy team or you could use it for speeding up to allow someone like an Olaf or a Darius to like run in and engage. I think that's enough utility. You'd still have some choices with your W, but now your E would unequivocally be like your really strong max skill that would provide a lot of steroids for your AD carry while at the same time allowing you to use your piece of CC. Because right now, the you know, you have to choose buff or CC, and a lot of other enchanters can get both. So I think that's a little rough on her, but she's still like okay. I mean, she's never like a, just a completely terrible champion, but she is often one of the like lowest win rate enchanters out there. Now, part of that is because like you can actually mess up even though her stuff is point click in team fights, you could accidentally like damage an enemy with your E instead of shielding an ally if you make the wrong click. So, she is someone that can mess up with that. So, I mean, she's got like a 51% win rate, which is, you know, not that bad. But it's still decidedly much, much lower than Soraka, Janna, and even Nami. So, Anyways, Sona, kind of down in the gutter too. I just think that Soraka is a much better version of Sona now. She has a lot more macro pressure with her ult in the mid game. Um, Sona's mana costs are extremely high early on. The return of mana regen on Frostfang is very nice for her. That's nice to Nami as well. Nami's a mana hog in lane too. So that is going to help them out a little bit. But I still think that <coughs> Soraka is just a much better version of Sona right now. Her numbers are just much higher after Sona's been nerfed so many times. You know, Sona's W is healing people for like, you know, 50 or something like that. Just like really low numbers. Maybe slightly higher than that at some point. But it's just like laughably low numbers for single target uh, compared to what Soraka does. Now, in a team fight, like a clean 5v5 team fight, if you're touching like four people with your W shield then yes, that's going to be uh, potentially stronger than Soraka. But it's just a lot more conditional, and you have to really like get into some risky positions to maximize that ability. She does have a really nice ult. Like that CC AoE ult is very good with like Jarvan, Rumble, Misfortune, all these other like AoE team comps. So she does have that. She's not terrible, but I just think that Soraka is going to be a lot stronger. Now, if Soraka gets banned a lot, Sona could be a decent backup, but um, she's still going to have some problems. You definitely want to go with the Airy Athene's build on Sona because she has very good poke in the early game and she scales pretty well. Um, and Athene's stacks up really quickly with her Q spam, so you get a lot of extra healing. Now, Pike is someone that I do have a bit lower. A lot of the all caps videos will swear by Pike being like a hard carry um, support. And he's pretty good. He has been nerfed out. He is kind of susceptible to poke in the laning phase. He's all offense, has very little defense, very little peel. But. He is one of the most mobile champions in the game. He's fantastic at roaming. He has some of the best vision game, probably the best vision game, maybe even a little bit better than Rakan, just because he can go in invisible around the wards and he can place those really deep wards safely in the enemy jungle because he has the E to dash away and he has the W for the movement speed. So that is really nice. 
and he can go Umbral as a first item, which gives him an extra sweeper. So he's really, really good at dominating, running up and down the lanes. The problem is he's not going to be able to get priority in the lane as easily. He has virtually no wave clear. Um, his hook is a pretty good threat against squishies, but a lot of people are still running like the heavy tanks. Um, even though the Soraka and Janna are very strong, a lot of people still just aren't playing those champions. If we look at the pick rates here, it's still going to be Thresh, Nautilus, Leona, Blitz, Pike, Senna, to an extent, are still going to be a lot of the strongest champions um, that people are going to play. So it's only once you get down into like the 6th and the 7th slot where you start seeing the enchanters. So even though they're very strong, a lot of people don't realize their strength or just straight up they don't like playing something like Soraka and Janna. So... He's, it's a lot harder to win against Nautilus and Leona because if you pull them, they're just going to smack you and CC you and blow you up probably. So the meta is still a little rough for Pike, but if you do get ahead, if you do get those kills, he is one of the highest snowball champs in the game. Um, so there is that potential there. Now Morgana is somebody who's really popular. Now she's banned a lot. She's banned even more than Nautilus is, 40%. Um, because she's just really annoying to deal with, with the black shield and like the three second bind is very frustrating. So she can be a good pick against things like Nautilus, like Leona. She just has really long cooldowns. Um, and she is very vulnerable to poke and potentially all in if people play around that black shield really well. So she's okay. She's still pretty good. Items are pretty weak on her. Runes are pretty weak on her, but just her baseline, the black shield and her three second bind are strong enough to make her viable. And then Thresh is somebody that I just kind of threw in down here at the bottom. Um, I think he's in a pretty bad spot overall right now. He's always going to be very popular. But he just has really weak runes, really weak items. <coughs> His matchup against Nautilus is terrible. It's because Nautilus out CCs you, and it's just really hard to peel him because he has so many different forms of engage. His matchup against Leona is actually pretty decent because you can flay back her E. Um, you get a lot of notice on that. But... Um, He's okay. It's just like he takes a lot of skill to play and he requires a lot of cooperation with your team. People have to actually click the lanterns. You have to actually hit the hooks and make good decisions on whether or not you should go in. So he's all right. He's always going to be like a pretty decent champion. But the fact that there are um, much stronger tanks out there with more CC right now and the fact that he does get outscaled hard by Soraka and Janna later on in the game just puts a lot of pressure on you to really hard outplay your opponent. So if you want to do that, you're going to be working overtime for the same wages, though, basically, if you're playing Thresh. But if you like that, if you like the challenge, if you really want to play him, he can still be all right. But anyways, that's going to be it for this video. Thank you very much. Sorry it's a bit longer. I did want to explain a lot of stuff, though, because I know a lot of people have been out of the game for a while, you know, the last couple of months during the preseason. They might be coming back. So just wanted to break it all down for you. But anyways, that's going to be it. Thank you very much. Have a good day, and we'll see you next time.